Welcome to Three Night Weekend, where we prepare you for the weekend to come with the help of gaming industry luminaries. I'm Shane Satterfield, and you can find me on the world's most advanced gaming website, Sifted, at sifted.net, or on Twitter, at Dinfire. If you want to support us, head to patreon.com slash sifted and drop us a pledge. The show goes live for our patrons on Friday and Monday for everyone else. This week, we talk with Gerard Williams, a.k.a. Hip Hop Gamer. He's been bringing his unique flair to games journalism for over a decade, and as a person of color, has a unique perspective on working in the industry. He's also deeply involved in community work in Brooklyn, New York. He's a busy guy with his hands in many pies, and it makes for a great episode of Three Night Weekend. All right, here we are with Gerard Williams, although you probably know him as a hip hop gamer. He has been a games journalist for... I think it's been well over a decade at this point. Also, I would like to add a good friend of mine who I always enjoy hanging out with at various events that we run into each other at. Gerard, welcome to Three Night Weekend. Yo, Three Night Weekend, you already know what it is, man. It's the one and only hip-hop gamer. No stranger to danger. Number one journalist. Quickly, I changed the game up. Yo, Shay, what's going on, B? <laughs> I'm what's doing good, man. I'm doing good, man. I'm still alive after this crazy pandemic, so I can't complain too much. <laughs> How have you done through all this? Man, yo, man, I've been blessed, man. Like, even though, you know, uh, it's been a sad, you know, time for, you know, a lot of people, you know me, man, I'm, I always find the good and the great things, you know what I'm saying, even regardless of what's going on around me. So um, one of the big things for me, from a standpoint of a personal situation, just like personal life, man, mm -hmm. just, uh, you know, being around the family more, you know, having yeah. more fun, um, you know, in that way and just appreciating and, and just, you know, thanking God for everything that I have that much more. And from a business standpoint, man, you know, gaming, man, I don't care if it's re if it's a recession or whatever it is. Um, I've been the gaming industry overall has been able to withstand all of it. So yeah. from a business standpoint, oh man, it's been incredible. Actually, uh, let me tell you right now, um, I did a partnership, bro, with Qualcomm, and oh, it wow. launches and it launches today. And oh, I'm the face timing. of their, yeah, and, and I'm the face of their brand new marketing campaign with their Snapdragon processors and things of that nature. So the video, the theatrical video drops today. I think it dropped already. I'm not sure, but that's amazing. Yeah, man, it's crazy. So yeah, that's how my life been, man. <laughs> I've been, I've been doing can, amazing uh, things. How can listeners find uh that that whole program that you did with Qualcomm? Um, on their YouTube channel? Yeah, it, I think it's gonna be on their YouTube channel. Uh, it should be up there now. If it's not up there now, it'll be debut. It'll debut today because they already started rolling out some new videos about it. But um, I know uh, I think it's on their website as well. But it's a big deal, man. It's a real big deal, and there's more to come. So that's, that's awesome. just one out of many things. Congratulations! Do you miss the grind of being a games journalist as far as traveling for events and things like that? Because all those things have kind of gone away over the last year. Yeah, well, you know me, dog. I'm a people person. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? I want to see are. everybody, dap everybody up, hug everybody up, and just have fun, man. So I, I definitely miss it. And me personally, just within my personality, you know, I'm very animated. You know yep. what I'm saying? So I'm, I'm, so I'm, I'm kind of like VR. You could talk about it, but you don't know how impactful it is until you experience it. And I'm the kind of person where when you see me at events, that's when you really understand the impact of hip hop gamer. You know what I mean? So I, I definitely miss it. Can't wait to get back to that. I would I would say I agree with that one thousand percent. That is what is what draws me to you to hang out with you at events. You're very positive. You you have a lot of energy. You're very excited. I think the industry needs more of that. But first, let's rewind. Let's talk about the young hip hop gamer. What what was your childhood like? Where did you grow up? Tell us a little bit about that. Got you. So I grew up in East New York, Brooklyn. Okay. All right? So and I grew up in the '80s. You know what I'm saying? I was born in '82. So I grew up in the '80s. You know what I'm saying? And in that era it was it was heavily driven by crack you know what i'm saying yeah. it was a crack era like not just new uh, york everywhere yeah yeah you know everywhere yeah. you know what i'm saying so you know my upbringing you know i never met my mother you know you never uh, met her yeah i never met my mother in my life uh, she, uh, she left when i was about i think two years old but wow. I, I never met my mom's i don't remember ever seeing her or anything like that i've seen a picture here and there but i don't know you my never moms. had any contact with her no at all. ever in my life so um so with my grandmother, she's the one who, you know, raised me, 
you know, took care of me. And, um, you know, my pops was around too, but he was more in the gangster street life at that time. Oh. You know what I'm saying? Uh-huh. So with my grandmoms, she's the one who taught me how to play games, you know, when wow. I was four years old. <laughs> That's so, amazing. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, my grandmother, she is a gamer herself. So she literally taught me about video games and she taught me a lot about life through video games. And she also, you know, brought me closer to God. So, um, my upbringing, um, that's what shaped my character and gaming has such a big impact on me because it allowed me to discover my joy. Cause you know, growing up, you know, we ain't have much. Right. So certain times you go to school or, or you deal with certain things, certain, certain days I couldn't, you know, wash up well, you know what I mean? So mm-hmm. I wasn't smelling too good. Like, yeah, you know how the kids get, you know what I mean? Yeah, you and stuff like that. Yeah. So, you know, just battling a lot of these things that, um, I didn't always have control over, but when I, play video games man it gave me the sense of joy the sense of power the sense of purpose so that's why gaming means that much to me that's why when you see me at events and my energy is yo it this is where it stems from so i just wanted to give you my like history on my upbringing when it came to the gaming side now moving on to the music side because they call me hip-hop gamer um when i turned 14 that's when i started making music that's when i like really started taking it serious uh now were you producing tracks or just rapping Nah, I was just rapping. I, um, okay. there's a, I, now I'm not going to lie. There is a couple of songs that I did produce myself. There was this um, old program called Magics. And there was this other, uh, uh, another I'm familiar program with called Magics. Fru- yeah. Magics. Yeah. <laughs> so I used to use Magics back in the day. And they also had Fruity Loops. Um, that I yeah, used to I know use, Fruity uh, Loops back too. In the day. Yep. Some people still use that, actually, to this day, yeah. believe it or not. Absolutely. You're right. So the thing is, I, I, I made some beats for myself as well. But for the most part, you know, I had producers that would make beats and I would do songs and I was heavy, heavy in the, you know, just straight up raw gangster rap, like, you know, everything like that. But mm-hmm. what happened is um, once I started uh, seeing uh, the industry, the business side of it, like the dark side of it, yeah. I just didn't want to be a part of it. Like literally my spirit was conflicting with going forward with that road. And I just felt like I was uh, letting my grandma down. And also I felt like um, I felt like I was in a dark place period. And that's why I was being drawn to it. And once I started to get more and transition more out of that dark place in that dark state of mind, I started to see uh, the error in my ways, so to speak. And I mm-hmm. left that alone. But I kept doing music, but I just started making songs for video games. And that's what led me to doing songs for Twisted Metal and, and Halo and Watch Dogs and and I'm also a character in those games, too. So it's like things change, man. But that's pretty much like my upbringing between video games, hip hop and just like my personality and, and how I came to be. OK, let's rewind again just for a second. So you have you tried to reach out to your mother at all throughout your life or have you just kind of written her off and just decided that you're better off without her in your life? Um, I, I never tried to look for her. Uh-huh. Um. And the, I guess the reason why is because, which is a great question, by the way, because when I was, I think, six years old, she sent a, a letter to the house. And, um, you know, we read the letter and I found out that I think I got two other siblings oh, wow. uh, on her side. But uh-huh. it, it made me think I was like, well, if you wrote a letter to me, that means, you know, where I'm at. Right. And regardless of what the situation was before. Cause I'm, I'm a child. I don't know what's going on. Right. And me being a adult today, I can see how certain things can be where, you know, certain things are out of your control and you can't do nothing. And I, you know, I understand that, but when this, a, when you have the opportunity to make it right, you know, you try to make it right. Yeah. And when she sent the letter, I was like, something's wrong here mm-hmm. because you Even know, where at I'm that at. age, you could see it. Yeah. I, I, I you know where I'm at. I never met you. Like I have no remembrance of anything. You should come see me. Yep. And she never did. So wow. I never went to looking and you know, I just went on with my life. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not bitter. I'm not upset. Everything's everything happens for a reason and everything works, you know, uh uh for the greater good. You know, that's the way mm-hmm. God operates. So there was a reason for this. Yeah. And whatever that reason is, I trust it because the way I turned out. In this day and age, I am truly, truly humbled and truly blessed. What I will say to my mom, if she's out there and I pray that she's still alive and everything and she's doing well, that I love my mom. Uh I love her. I honor her. I love her, even though I never met her. 
know what I'm saying? Because I truly understand what love is about. So I, I love my mom and I hope she's doing well. I think that's the right attitude. Um, how did you stay out of the streets? How did you keep from getting mixed up with, as you said, crack and sort of street life and drugs and crime and all that kind of stuff? Well, part of it was gaming. Okay. Uh, part of it was gaming. Um, secondly, um, too many people started dying around me. Okay. Like, That'll you know what I'm saying? Like, yep. like, yeah, like, like too many people in the hood started dying, like, uh, around me, man. And, um, and not dying, murdered, I am assuming. Oh, yeah, yeah, murdered. Like, too many people yeah. was getting killed and getting yeah. robbed. And it's like, you know, you grow up, you know what I'm saying? And, you know, all of this, like, gangster stuff, you know what I'm saying? Like, it gets glorified. It because does. that's because that's in hip hop. Let's be honest. A like lot in, of it in hip hop. Hip -hop. Yeah. yeah. But that but that's the way we look at as a way for us to make money. Mm -hmm. So you got to understand, bro. Like and this also relates to the gaming industry, too. And we'll get into that as well. But like when you look at a lot of people, especially, you know, growing up and stuff like that, we ne we never had those like chances and opportunities to you know, be in certain rooms and certain boardrooms and and have the money to, you know, fund ourselves and do certain things. You know what I'm saying? Banks wouldn't give us, up, give us certain loans. Yep. They would give other people stuff. Like, systematically, like, we was always left out of that wealth thing. So when you look at uh, people like Master P and Jay-Z and, you know, 50 Cent and, like, tons of other people, you know, entrepreneurs, it's like, you know, so drugs, so music, like, you know, all this other stuff just to get the capital to be able to go legit and do stuff. So in our eyes growing up, this is our, like for us that wanted the, the big house and cars and jewelry and girls, this is what we saw commercially as the way to get those things. Mm -hmm. So that's what we follow. And what I started to realize personally in my life that it's a higher chance that you're going to end up dead or in jail going this going this route. Yeah. And, and I didn't want that for me. And, and I love my grandma so much to the point where I didn't want to, you know, break her heart. So yeah, I just decided to not go that route and not follow that anymore. And um, and you know how it is, man. You could be smart and you could also have wisdom. You could do something, make a mis make a mistake, and be smart enough to try to like to not make that same mistake again. Or you could have wisdom and you could see issues, like just observing. Yeah, and then avoid it completely. Because of you being that observant that, hey, this can happen to me or I'm going down that same road. So I just yeah. chose to do something different. I always say being smart is being able to memorize things. Having wisdom is being able to see what's going to happen before it happens. Absolutely. There you go, bro. There you go. Big time. So, so yeah, that's what I did. So you your hip hop career fizzled not basically on your own accord because you didn't want to get mixed up in the industry. Yes. Granted back then the music industry was a lot different because it was run by music labels instead of sort of by the artists that was before Napster and the advent of the MP3, which completely flipped the music industry on its head. Have you ever considered maybe trying to go back now that it's a lot different? No. Well, that's the thing. I, I, I do it now, but just in video games. So like, like I said, I did the theme song for Watch Dogs 2. That's mm -hmm. in the video game. Like, yeah. you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, um, I released a song uh, earlier this year called Press Start, which is like an anthem for anybody that's a gamer and for anybody that wants to do something in their life. In order to, if, you, if you're about to play a game, you can't do it unless you what? Press start. So it's the same thing in life. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. You got to start something. You can't always think about the outcome or what's going to happen or blah, blah, because the result is this. If you do nothing, nothing is going to happen. And that's a hundred percent facts. But if you start something, you don't know what's going to take you. So you got to just start. So that's what the song is about. And I got um, a bunch of other songs um, too. Like I actually did a new song for death loop and stuff like that. Wow, so uh, that's great. Even, that's good to hear. Yeah. So even though the game, cause I was September 14th, um, I'm looking to actually make a music video for it and uh, talk to Sony about it. To, I mean, while well, I spoke with some people already about it, and um, but I'm I'm looking to really make that happen for this fall, That's uh, with the song I did for Deathloop. So I'm making music still, but just you know in the gaming in area, a different way. Yeah. Yes. So after your hip hop career didn't happen, or you you decided you didn't want it to happen, when and why did you decide to pursue a life and career in games? Um. So what happened is uh, I was watching G4 Tech TV, right? Mm -hmm. 
And, you know, I'm a big fan of Adam watching Sussler. our show, X-Play? <laughs> um, X- yeah, yeah, I love X-Play, man. Love X-Play, Attack of the Show. I love all of that. You know what I'm saying? The whole team, Kevin Pereira, Morgan Webb, like, the, you know, Olivia Munn, like the whole squad. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. You know, I was watching them, and I was a big fan. So there was one um, episode, and I think this was around Christmas time, where it started to feel like the, the corporations was starting to take control over the voices uh-huh. of the personalities that I grew to love. And to me, it wasn't authentic um, anymore. And then eventually, you know, it dissolved. It's, that was after you know, I left now. Gerard to go to yeah, well, yeah, after, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, that's after you left. But I'm just saying, like, I'm that's joking. what I that's what I saw. So when I saw that, um, you know, I'm the kind of person where I'm not going to complain. I'm going to create. Yeah. So that's so that inspired that me. to make, Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So that inspired me to make my first uh, video. And just to give you some insight, bro, before it was hip hop gamer, it was actually hip hop gamers. You know what I'm saying? It was me. It was me and my boy Julio. And we worked in the mailroom. And what's so funny is when I worked in the mailroom from 2000 to 2014, um, I worked in the mailroom for every single record label. So uh, I know irony. everybody. <laughs> yes, I know every. When you talk about the music industry, everybody from like you, know, you name it, Jay Z and the Rockefeller team, uh, Steve Stout and the Scope. You know, like everybody. I I, I know them all, bro, because I was in the mailroom. It was my job to know everybody. Uh-huh. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So it was, uh, the irony. So um, so I did that right. But uh, anyway, you know, going back to the um to the hip hop gamers. Uh, he couldn't continue because he was having, you know, like some personal uh, issues. Uh-huh. So, you know me, I ain't going to stop you know, for nobody. Uh, <laughs> so Hip Hop Gamers became Hip Hop Gamer and I remained consistent. And I got discovered by Torrance Davis, you know, on the bitbag.com back then. Uh-huh. And he gave me the opportunity to put my show on his website. And because of that and because of my consistency and my work, I got um, I got a chance to go to E3 because of him back in 2008. And that was my first ever E3 and I've been going ever since. And then once I once I got the E3 in 2008, that's when I got a chance to see the business side of things. That's when I got, got a chance to see the industry. And then I also got to see how the industry viewed me and how I was treated. Now, for the for the most part, um, there's there's a few people that really embraced me and showed me love and like helped me out. But there was a great amount of people and a great amount of organizations that was like, you don't belong here. Like, like you, you, you're unprofessional, you're loud, you don't look the part, and um, you're black. Like, why are you here? So, so, let's, so let's rewind, though, because at yeah. some point you created sort of the persona hip hop gamer with the belt and sort. And like, I don't know if that's just you or if that's something that you consciously created to, like, help stand out. How did that all happen? Yeah, well, if you I'm not sure if you remember, but um. My very first E3, uh, I had the belt. Like, like you know what I'm saying? Like, I always, like, started out with the belt. See, the thing is, I'm a Why big fan of wrestling. Why did you decide of... to do that? Okay, so, I'm a, one, I'm a big fan of wrestling. I'm a big fan of boxing. And I always viewed myself as a champion. But the okay. main thing is my grandmother. Okay. My, my grandmother always called me uh, her champion. And she was my champion. So, for me, I looked at it as a standpoint of I always felt – that because of my passion and because of my upbringing, when it came to games, I always felt like I was the realest. I always felt like I was the best. And I always felt like I had something unique to offer. So I put my you know, best foot forward that when I came into the industry officially, I always, regardless of what other people would think or say, I always felt like I was the best to ever be in the industry. I always felt like I was the best ever. Not to say that Hey, I'm better than this guy. I'm better than this girl. Nah, I personally, in my heart, in my soul, always felt like I was the best because I had something to offer that nobody else had to offer. And when I came into the industry officially, especially after that first year at E3, I was proven to be correct. Because and I and I, and to prove my point is, so many people came up to me. You know what I mean? Yeah. And like, I give you examples. Scott Fry, that used to work at Ubisoft, yeah. stuff like that. Yeah. Um, that's my bro. Love Scott Fry to death, man. That's my guy. guy. Yeah. And Scott Fry came up to me. He was like, "Yo, you are exactly what we've been missing in this industry for so long. I haven't seen this type of fire in forever. Like, you actually love being here. Like, like it's like in, in my mind, I thought that was the norm." And it was yeah, because what happens with a lot of people is they get very jaded over time and the job starts to lose its luster 
And that's the first thing I noticed about you was your energy and how excited you were to be wherever we were. And I had been in the industry for a long time by the point I met you. And so I had been around all these other people who had kind of lost the excitement for the job. Um, and it was very refreshing to meet you and meet someone who was excited about it again. And I'll be honest with you, it helps, it helped energize me. And I'm sure that's the same case for a lot of people. Wow. That, I mean, well, hearing that come from you is amazing, man, because like, I don't care what nobody say. You Shane Satterfield, bro. <laughs> you Shane Satterfield. Own it. You are Shane Satterfield. I you know what I'm saying? I watch that. you for, like, I love you, bro. I watch you plenty of times, man. I know what it is. So to me, and that's what I'm saying. It's like, it's 2021. My first E3 is 2008. My energy is probably even higher now. Yeah. Like, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, you haven't there. changed. That's, like, like, that's another amazing thing. You haven't become jaded at all. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like, I'm hyped every day, son, about this, man. But what I realized when I got in the industry is that to most people, it was a job. To me, it was actually my life. It's well, I don't think it's hard for most life. people as a job. I think for a lot of people, it, it they're like you when they first start. They're wide-eyed. They're really excited about it. They can't believe that they have the job that they have. But for some people, I think the grind over time, because I think you will also admit that being a games journalist isn't as glamorous as it appears on the outside. Or would you not agree with that? I don't agree with that at all. I, okay. I'm going to tell, tell you why I don't agree with it. Um, on the outside looking in, I see your point. But that's because a lot of these people work for companies. Yeah. See, remember, I never had a job in the industry, bro. I've been independent since day one. Yeah, so I always true. did, I always point. did, yeah, I always did what I wanted to do. Always. Like, you know what I'm saying? So because I was free to do whatever I wanted to do out the gate, even when I work with people, you see me, I, I'm partnered with Logitech, partnered with Hot 97. I got other partnerships I haven't even announced yet. And today we got the Qualcomm. I got yeah. a whole bunch of other stuff that I'm doing. You know what I'm saying? So yeah. my thing is, I always did what I wanted to do because I told you before, like, I always felt that I brought something to the industry that nobody else um, could do. And um, I got my own style. I know my craft. I know the industry and the culture. So because of that, the I guess the freedom is what allowed me to, like, always be happy and be grow because I could control my own destiny, so to speak. Whereas, and, and I prove it to you, at Michael Pappas' party, and I'll give you one of the most recent ones, the one in, I think, 2018. The last one that we ever had <laughs> until the world almost. Ended. I, I know, right? <laughs> I know, right? So yeah. shout out to Michael Pactor because Michael Pactor is another one that came up to me and showed me mad love because my grandmoms, you know, loved Michael Pactor. My grandmoms had mad love for Michael Pactor. That's you awesome. Know what I'm saying? And I told Michael <laughs> Pactor about that. Yeah, like my grandmoms is a gamer, son. Like that's what I'm saying. Like, like Does my she watch Pactor Factor? It. That, well, she watched uh, that. I think she had passed away by then. Oh, okay. I'm, I'm sorry mistaken. to hear but that. I didn't realize that she had passed. Yeah, she passed away in 2010. Oh, okay. Stuff like that. So, um, so, but the thing is, uh, you know, just going to my point, um, there was a gentleman that came up to me at Pactus Party. And he was like, yo, I just want to tell you that I'm so happy to see you still here, like yeah. doing your thing and having fun. And he literally, I didn't, he just came up to me uh -huh. and he like literally opened up, was like, yo, like I'm trying to be independent now and do my own thing. Mm -hmm. But it's not working because everybody thinks I'm fake. But the problem is I had to be fake to get my job because I think he was working at IGN and then he went to another website. If I'm not mistaken, I think the Structoid or something like that. And hey, I got a job. But the thing is, he couldn't fully be himself in the process of getting those jobs. And then I'll be, once he I'll was be perfectly let, honest with you. I think most people feel that way working in this industry. I don't feel like I've ever truly been myself on camera or in any other respect, to be honest with you. Like, it's not like I betray my ideals when I go on camera, but I definitely tone myself down when I'm on camera <laughs> compared to how I am in my private life, for sure. Now, see, and this is, so I was labeled as somebody that was unprofessional. You know what I'm saying? But in my mind, I'm like, how am I unprofessional if I'm breaking stories, I'm getting the biggest interviews, and my interviews are the best, period. And, and my resume overall just, like, in the industry period, I could put my resume against anybody. And the degree of difficulty doing this as an independent person, the degree of difficulty of doing this as a black person, like in this space and stuff like that, all the negatives that you can throw, like literally what you just said in terms of toning it down or whatever on camera because uh, such, 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 that's horrible to me because yeah. what, what it is- I don't is, like it. <laughs> you're, you're, what it. What it is is you are, um, you are 
dumbing down the very thing that makes gaming beautiful. You are like, like when you, when Christmas time comes, right? And I'll never forget this. I'm sitting down, right? And my grandmother, she uh, she said, there's one more gift that I got to bring down. She came downstairs with a gift. It was wrapped in red. And um, I opened it up and it was a Super Nintendo. And I was, uh-huh. I lost my mind. I had Super <laughs> Nintendo and I had Sega Genesis. Wow. I had everything. I lost my mind. I cried, jumped up and down. I was so happy. You know what I'm saying? And my thing is that moment right there, like a kid on Christmas day getting something that you love, that is the beauty. That is the reason why this industry exists in the first place. Because at the end of the day, the industry is supposed to be about fun and sharing that fun. And anybody that comes into the industry is supposed to add to what makes it beautiful. So as a journalist or whatever, I hear a lot of these people talk about, well, you need to be like this because you're be professional. Like, look, are you kidding me? Gaming is an industry that's supposed to, it's just like hip hop to me. Because a lot of people looked at hip hop as just a fad and it's going to die. And that's oh, number that's one. And, and it's number, exactly. <laughs> it's, it's the number one happening. music. <laughs> exactly. It's the number one form of music. You know what I'm saying? And then gaming, number one form of entertainment. So I, so my name, Hip Hop Gamer, my name at the core represents the embodiment, the embodiment of what we actually love. But then you get people that's in a position of power that got the money that don't understand yet or care about the culture of gaming or whatever, telling you how to be, telling you how to do, telling you what the, are you kidding me? I've never been controlled by money, bro. I don't do that, son. You know what I'm saying? You can keep that, man. I'm going I'm to do me. Well, you spoke earlier about how you feel like you weren't taken seriously or that people considered you unprofessional at times. I mean, do you think of some of that is because you kind of have this alter ego that that you present, the hip-hop gamer, the belt? Um, do you think that maybe that is why people have kind of tagged you with that that moniker? Um, no, because um, because you stand not, out, it, and it's a double edged sword, right? So you, you have your hip hop gamer. Right? You, you have to realize you go to events. There's no one like you. There's nobody. You know, no other journalists have kind of like a costume that they take with them, or the. And look, it it probably is just you, and I believe it is just you. But I think outwardly, people may look at it like it's a shtick. Um, it's a character that you're playing. It's a. It's like wrestling almost. It's like you meet a wrestler when they're on camera. They're crazy. But then when you meet them after the match is over, they're just a normal dude who drives a pickup truck or whatever. Do you think maybe people just kind of expected that that was the case with you and maybe that's why you ran into kind of those roadblocks? Um, no, the truth is nobody never seen somebody like me make it in the same space that they was in. So that was foreign to them. So they so instead of accepting it and respecting it, they try to find ways to write me off because they didn't want to believe it. Did you not Period. think Period. about that though before you decided to like take the belt to your first E3? Did you think about like I'm going to stand out and that can be really good because let's be honest most game journalists they all just kind of blend in as average white dude. Um exactly. but it could also but it could also be a negative in that maybe people in the industry won't take you as seriously as you had hoped. Well see my thing is I never cared whether they took me seriously or not. That wasn't my thought process. Here's here's one thing that I'll tell you that um that I'll let you in on. One, it's not an alter ego, like at all. Like this is me. But the problem is because the like industry- when you go get when you go to get lunch, do you take the belt with you? Uh no, man. I don't take the belt with me when I go to get lunch. Nah, I'm talking but about that's the what energy. I'm, saying. Like, in your I'm talking about the energy in my oh, persona. Yeah. I mean, I absolutely believe that this this is you. Your energy is your energy. Yeah, but, that's what I mean. Yeah. Oh, I like, I think I don't think anybody ever questioned that about you, Gerard. Like, I don't think anyone ever thought your energy or excitement for the industry was fake. Like, I don't think that's ever been true. You'll be surprised. Really? You'll be surprised. You wanna, <laughs> then they you don't know, know you. That's all I can say. They don't know you. <laughs> but that, but that's the thing. That's the problem. A lot of people pass judgment, and based off their judgment and their position, think about it like this, right? Let me set let me set the table up for you. So if I'm somebody that's on IGN every day, Mm -hmm. and this is a company that's backed by millions of dollars, and they have a lot of reach with their voice simply because of their financial position and their branding, right? Well, I mean, there's been a lot of hard work that's gone into IGN in 20 years. You're not, no, you're not understanding my point. My point is, if somebody gets on that platform and they talk every day, media shapes the minds of people 
that are weak minded that can't judge for themselves or see things for themselves and experience things for themselves to know the facts. Agree with that a thousand percent. Okay. So the point is, if you have a lot of people looking at somebody like me and these people in high positions get to talking, get to talking, get to talking, it's going to create a narrative that I'm somebody that I'm not. And this is just unprofessional. And this is fake. And this ain't really him. Nobody could be that happy all the time. Nobody could be that full of energy all the time. And then what happens is once you're proven wrong, and that is who he is, and that is the reality of it. Now you have no choice but to accept it because I ain't going nowhere. Yeah. But, but the problem is there was so much talking done and so much damage done without even having a conversation with me to know what's real. Yeah. And that that's to a lot of people. <laughs> exactly. So that's, so that's the problem that I faced before people even had a conversation with me to get to know me. They already passed their judgment on major platforms that made it harder for me to be me. But, but do <laughs> like, you, you know think it's because of the persona that they did that, though? That's the question I'm trying to get at. Oh, yes, yes, yes. It is because of the persona that they did that. Why? Because they've never seen that before. Yeah. So think about it. If if you go to school, if you go to school and your school is uh, 95, 96 percent, you know, uh, white people, then you get a black person that comes to your school and they act completely different from you in your mind. You're going to look at that as foreign, different or wrong or something that you're not used to. So because it's not your comfort zone or something that you're not used to, it's easy to write it off, demolish mm-hmm. it, make fun of it, like whatever it is you're going to do. But if you go to a neighborhood that's 95 percent black and then you're the only white dude there, then you become the one that's the foreign person. You become yeah. the one that's out of place or whatever. So yep. if you look at the game industry and you know what it is, and then I show up, come on. Like, you're saying, like, you already know what's going to happen. So what I love about what I decided to do, what I love about what I did was that I stayed true to who I was from the moment my grandma introduced me to games. And that same kitty like energy, that same love, and that same passion that I grew up with is the very thing that I wanted to give back to the industry. Because when I got into the industry, I started to see, like you said, a lot of people that was jaded, a lot of people that wasn't excited. Yo, I remember at E3, uh, not, uh, at, so- at a Sony conference, I forgot, which, uh, the conference when they showed off uh, Final Fantasy VII Remake for the very first time, the very first trailer that they showed it off. I stood up, held my belt up. I'm up here grabbing people at the side of me. Remember, so, like there was one year where somebody was sitting next to me and I didn't even know this person. I didn't even care. I grabbed this person. I'm like, yo, you see this? You see this? And the dude did a podcast saying, yo, if you've never met this dude named Hip Hop Gamer, everybody in the industry needs to meet him. I haven't been so excited to be at a conference in so many years, but sitting next to Hip Hop Gamer maybe reminded me of why I do what I do. That's amazing. And that's what I wanted. That's all I wanted to bring to the industry. I just want people to remember why we love what we love instead of all of this hate and all this negativity that I be seeing all the time, man, it, it, it hurts me, man. It hurts me, man. So that's, that's one of the things I want to do to, to just give that love back, man. Okay. Um, let's strip away the whole hip hop gamer thing. And let's talk about what it's like to be a person of color in the games industry, or maybe even more specifically uh, games journalism do you feel like you've ever faced any sort of discrimination um, doing the job or just mingling in the industry? What's that been like for you? Shane, you know the answer is yes. Well, I have Bro, to ask like, you the questions. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I no, can't answer true. for you. Then I just interview myself. <laughs> yeah, no, no, you're right. You're right. But yeah, of course the answer is yes, man. And and like one thing about me, though, you know, I keep it real. I was on David Jaffe's show uh, not too long ago. And um. And one of the things that I brought up is, let, just to give you an example, um, uh, there was a point in time where I was the, matter of fact, I didn't share this story uh, on David Jaffe. So I'll share this story here just so you can understand what's going on. Okay. So um, I want to give a big shout out to my man, uh, uh, Cade uh, Peterson, and stuff like that. So I'm not sure if you remember, but um, I think I'm the first, yeah, I think I'm the first journalist to ever be um, in the, the ever be a character in PlayStation Home, when PlayStation Home was out during PS3, 
And when this announcement, because when this announcement came out, you could dress your avatar up with my belt. You could walk around. You could go into the movie theater and see my videos inside the PlayStation home. It was a big deal. Yeah, it was a that's big really cool. deal because nobody never seen uh, you know, a, a black person get that type of, you know, accolade. So it's uh, accomplishment. Recognition. Know, yeah. Recognition. So Kay told me personally how he had to really, 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 really fight to get that for me. And I, I'm so thankful for Kay. But let me tell you something. After that happened, man, it was crazy. Like a lot of people was like, not just in the comment section, I'm talking about like certain journalists too. Cause even when I became the ambassador for the ECA at the time, um, I forgot the what the whole abbreviation meant. It was such a while ago. But even when I became the ECA ambassador, all these articles started coming out about the, the troubled hip hop gamer. What makes me troubled? And then Ben Kishura, I forgot what website he wrote for, but even Ben Kishura was like, yo, hip hop game, why would you have him? He starts fights and he does this and he does that. He and starts like, fights? What? Yes. He went on Game Attack Radio, bro. Godfrey's podcast and, and Paris and all of them. Went on their podcast and started saying these things and stuff like that. You know, it did. What was the I, basis I, for him saying that? By the way, he worked at Polygon. I believe he Polygon, right? Yeah, Polygon. There. Yeah. And, and, and he's he's another person that um who got jaded in the industry, but thankfully he came out and openly admitted it because you could tell in his work that he kind of didn't really want to be in the industry anymore. He needed to take a break. But I, mm -hmm. I respect the fact that he admitted that. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, um, I was at an event with him, uh, a Call of Duty event, and it was me, him, and Torrance. And we uh, uh, taking pictures together, having a good time and everything like that. And, and then you do go and do that. Like we so already... Also, he said that on a podcast after you hung out with him. Yeah. So I'm like, what? Like, what? Yo, bro, I was like, where is this coming from? And then um, and then the thing is, what's so crazy is uh, about the whole situation is like. That's not the only time where I was faced with, like, you know, certain people. So do you being, believe that he did that because you're black? Uh, well, that came out later, like later on that came out. But initially, that wasn't the case. Initially, what happened was so let me let me just let you know. And, and you know this. The industry is very clickish. Oh, and, yeah. And especially back then, back in 2008, if you was caught, if certain people for IGN was caught talking to certain other people, they could actually lose their job because of that. It yeah. Was very, I, very, I mean, very when very I worked clickish. at GameSpot, we were told not to socialize with people from IGN. It was absurd. I was like, what are you talking about? I know them. They're cool. They're some of them are DJs like me. I want to talk with them about house music. Like, you can't yeah, it's tell crazy. me. DK who Money. <laughs> DK Money. You know what I'm saying? DK Money, my guy. It's like, but it, 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 it blows my mind. Yeah. So my thing is, if y'all not allowed to talk to each other and y'all got click, click your stuff, imagine what I had to fight through, bro. Yeah, I could see that. You understand I what I'm saying? Felt like I treated you that way. <laughs> no, no, nah, nah. You you never treated me that way. But the point I'm trying to but the point I'm trying to make is that what people don't understand is that there's a lot of barriers that I had to break down on the behind the scenes because, bro, I was at a Ubisoft party and a gentleman um at the Ubisoft, Ubisoft party pulled me to the side and told me to my face. He was like, "Look, I love what you do. I'm a fan of yours, but I can't be seen with you like that." because it could be problematic for me. But I just wanted to personally tell you, because I wouldn't, I just didn't want you to go out like that. I, I wanted to tell you that. Was Look this the one from U Ubisoft Europe or Ubisoft no, US? No, 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 it wasn't. It was It was at a Ubisoft party. The person- But it wasn't was someone from Ubisoft? No, Okay. No, no. And they was like, yo, look around you and look at you. Like wow. a lot of people who find you very intimidating. You know what, and, if somebody and, had said that to you, I wish you would have come up to me and told me because we would have went over and had some words. Yeah, no, not nah, but see, but see, that's the thing. I can't in that position. I gotta take the hits in order for the barriers to break. Oh, Shane, I can't. You wild let out. somebody else help you take the hits, or maybe send a few back. <laughs> to no, be perfectly well, well, honest. Well, see, well, see, the thing is, timing is everything. See, in my situation, man, it's very easy for people to use me against me. You know what I'm saying? Like the like the the Sony situation um, uh, that happened. There was a time where, um, do you remember when they had the PlayStation MVP? Yeah, I do remember that. Now you see that that's gone, right? Yeah. Okay. Do you know why? Oh, I have no idea. 
Okay, so let me tell you, right? So shout out to my boy uh, Uriah um, uh, on, on the show radio. Uh, there was an event in New York and PlayStation had um, uh, an event where uh, Steph Curry was there, Snoop Dogg came through. It was a big event. Mm-hmm. And um, everybody that was a part of the PlayStation MVP program was allowed to bring a guest. Mm-hmm. Now, for some reason, I don't know what's going on or whatever, but at PlayStation, they had an amazing PR group. And then that PR group got let go. And then they got a brand new PR group and things changed. Like the European PR is amazing. Like they really? welcome everybody. Well, How have they you welcome managed everybody. to deal with them? <laughs> and, and, we always have and, to deal with the US PR. No, yeah, the US PR, when it changed, because the, the PR that I'm talking about, um, uh, like Eric Levine mm-hmm. and, and um, Alex Amrar Al- and all of them, amazing, yeah. amazing And they are team. all pretty much gone now. Yeah. yeah, amazing team. And then there was a new team that came in and things got very weird. Like, I was like, what's going on? How did they and get then, weird for you specifically once the PR shift so, happened? So it got weird because... One time I came up to the booth and when I came up to the booth, you know, I was just trying to like reestablish the relationship that was already there from the other people that left because I wasn't receiving anything anymore. I wasn't getting uh, invites anymore. Like it just stopped, like no word, no mm-hmm. nothing. So yeah. when E3 came around and, and I went to their booth, I just tried to figure out what was going on. Mm-hmm. And it was very weird. Now, remember, I'm from the hood, so I could peep with you know certain things going on mm-hmm. and certain people will go and then whisper to this person whisper to this person go in the back talk here they come to, up to me and say oh we don't have any slots available this and that this and that and i'm like oh really okay and then i will text somebody that's already back there that i'm cool with and i will text a developer that's back there they'd be like no nah, we good why, why are you not back here come on hip-hop because the the, the the developers really love me yeah they really love me because i speak to them and I ask questions that's going to help their game. Now, like, you know, like I got real relationships with people. Well, so, you're passionate about games. You're not, again, you're not jaded. You're not going to go and do a really boring interview. You're excited to talk to them about the thing that they've been working on for three or forever. four years. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So what happened is, so then it would come to me and I was just never allowed. And I'm like, so what happened? Like, I just trying to understand what happened, what took place. It just stopped. So then when the when the PlayStation uh, when the when that event happened in New York and Uriah brought me as a guest to be there, security came up to me. Really, security and it was like they took my bag and pushed me to the side and was like, "Hold on, we just need to double check something." And I was like, "Double check what? Like what? What's going on here? Like mm-hmm. this? Fe- yo, you know what it felt like? It felt like yo, I was like dealing with like police in the hood or something. Like huh. it felt." It felt bad and embarrassing, bro. I did but nothing. I just showed PR up to handling event. that event, or was it European PR? No, US. It was US PR. I never had a problem with European PR. So they knew no. who you were. They exactly. saw that you were there. Exactly. And they knew so, that they hadn't invited you. Is ba- is what you do you think happened? No, th- no, it didn't matter. The all the people that are PlayStation MVPs, they receive letters to of uh, invite, and they was able to bring a special guest. I was the special guest. No, I get that. Yeah. But, but as to why they came up to you, my guess might be that USPR knew you already and they knew that you were not on the guest list. So initially when they saw you, they were probably like, how no. did he get in here? They probably didn't know that you had come with an MVP. No, so no, now I, I hear that point, right? But let me tell you how that, how, what I'm about to tell you next crushes that. Okay. So this lady came up and I feel so bad because I don't remember her full name. I think her name was Alyssa. And she, Alyssa, is still a part of USPR for PlayStation. Yeah, yeah, but there, but there was more than one Alyssa. This Alyssa was events management or something like okay. that. And I think she's still there. But Alyssa was amazing. Like she walked up. Let me tell you how amazing Alyssa was. She walked up and yelled at security. She said, "What are y'all doing? That's hip hop gamer. Y'all don't know who he is. He's the he's the." Uh, the heartbeat like of this energy. He's the energy that we need here. Like, what are y'all doing? Let him in. Well, it's pretty and weird that you said Snoop Dogg was there, right? Yeah, Snoop Dogg was there. Steph Curry was there. 
um, I forgot what the announcement was. It was a big announcement that they was doing. I think it was, the, I, if I'm not mistaken, I think it was when they did PlayStation Heroes. I think it, it was PlayStation Heroes was supposed to be like an event where they empowering the kids and doing like more uh, amazing things in the community and stuff like that. I think it was called PlayStation Heroes. If I'm Are not you mistaken, talking about mistaken. Alyssa Casella? Is it yo? I'm about to go to LinkedIn right now. Blonde lady, kind of shoulder blonde, length hair. Yeah, blonde yeah, lady, uh, Alyssa yeah. Casella. Hold on a second. Hold She's up. She's amazing. Uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm pretty pretty much guarantee that's who it is because Alyssa, on, Alyssa awesome. Casella. Uh, no, that's not. I know, I, I know her, but that's oh, not okay. the person. Okay. Um, yeah, she's cool. I, I I I didn't have any issues with her, but that's not her. It's another. And at the end, and uh, it's another uh, Alyssa or something with a Issa in it or something like that. But the girl I'm talking about, she she is blonde. She had glasses on. She had glasses on, and um, she she was just the sweetest man. And what happened is, um, so I got in, and I got pictures too, like on my Instagram. I took a picture. It was me and um John Collar, uh, who works at Twitch now. Mm-hmm. But um, John Collar, that's my guy. Took a picture with him. We had conversations and everything. And, uh, you know, I got into the event. It was great. Next thing you know, the PlayStation MVP pre- program is ended and all this other stuff. And let's just say I heard whispers uh, behind the scenes that um, that uh, that play, that was part of the reason. Because they was like, uh, with the things that they wanted to do and the, and the way I got in because of the being a guest, uh, they didn't want things like that to happen anymore. So, like huh. I said, I'm like, yo, what is going on? Yeah, so, my, so, so the so the point so the point I'm trying to make is um is these are the battles that I constantly constantly fight and and here's something else that I that I learned too like um the imagery like for example um if you look at uh the industry as a whole right. Mm-hmm. And I ain't talk about now since George Floyd died and a lot of people feeling guilty. So now they want to do the put black people everywhere now and put and even now with the stop Asian hate. They want to show more Asians now. I ain't talk about the guilty people that feel guilty for never doing this because all of a sudden all this money and all this other stuff pops up and now they can do all these other things. I've been talking about this stuff since I came in day one. So I ain't trying to hear that. Certain certain companies like Logitech that I work with and a couple of others, they been about it like been doing things but for the most part a lot of this stuff is just checklist so they don't look bad so but anyway that's another conversation what i'm trying to what i'm trying to speak to you about real quick shane is that if you look at the industry as a whole and i'm talking about from the pr to games media to the box art of video games when it's released to the marketing dollars everything that's utilized to push if you do your research because i spoke about this on jaffe's stream as well but if you do the research right now if you want you'll see that when it comes to ethnic groups, um, black people are the highest consumers in gaming and TV and other things as well. But in gaming, as an ethnic group, over everybody else, yet we are the least represented in mainstream in every area. And yeah. it's a shame. I mean, I can see that clearly with my own my own two yeah, eyes. Yeah, it, it, it's a shame. So it my thing, yeah. yeah. So so my thing is, all I ever try to do was just have real conversations with people in the positions of power that are decision makers, so we could just so I could understand why are y'all doing this purpose or on purpose, like why, so we could get to a point of understanding, so we can make things more fair. That's all I'm talking about. I just want things to be more fair and balanced because if 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 a person don't have like I give you a great example, and I'm speaking from a journalist standpoint. I did an interview with Michael pa- Packer, right? Mm-hmm. And we were talking about Xbox Game Pass and, and the way their money works. And and Packer revealed that, you know, on the back end, they'll do like a, a $15 per hour type of thing or something like that because they're making money based off the usership, mm-hmm. not so much off of sales and everything like that. That's why Game Pass is trying to get their footing. And I broke this story before anybody. And then three days later, Jeff Keighley did, the, did an interview with Michael Packer and he get all the credit and all the sourcing and everything. And I'm like, yo, this is my joint. Like, what are you talking about? And then it's to the point where I had to reach out to different websites. And most of them didn't update it once I showed them the proof. But a few of them did. I think, uh, if I'm not mistaken, I think videogamer.com is one of the companies that updated it. But even when they updated it, 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 it was very subtle. So, my, so the point I'm trying to say is there's tons of stories, tons of things that I broke 
that other people will get a credit for just because they don't even view me as valuable. Well, I don't know. Look, I'll be honest with you, Gerard. That happens to us all the time. We are we do the show Pactor Factor and he'll say something on Pactor Factor like in some cases two months before and then someone will interview Pactor. He will repeat something that he had said on Pactor Factor six weeks earlier, four weeks earlier that gets picked up. Pactor Factor doesn't get picked up and it's not the problem is visibility. Because the truth of the matter is, you maybe you did break that story. Maybe Pactor Factor broke the story. But the truth of the, the matter is, is that Jeff has a lot more people following him. So when he tweets something, a lot more people see it. And so people just assume, because he get, he's getting all the pin action off of it, that he's the one that broke the story or broke the quote or whatever. It's I don't think it's endemic to you it happens to us all the time um i just in a lot of cases it's lazy reporting people who just didn't want to take the time to go back and dig and see where that information really came from the first time it's very easy to say it came from jeff Keeley because if you do that and you tweet your article he's going to retweet it to his million followers so there's incentive for these journalists to ignore the true source, which could have been you or could have been sifted or whatever to prop up Jeff because Jeff is then going to talk about it, retweet it, and suddenly your article gets a million views instead of if they had attributed us where it would probably get, you know, 5,000 or 10,000 views. It's, it's so, now I got, so now I got two things for you. So now I got two things for you. Now, that's one situation that I brought up. I'm going to bring up another situation. So and I, and I got two things for you. One, we have an unethical problem in the industry because based off what you just said, there's a lot of people that wouldn't know where the source came from, but because of their own personal gain, they will ignore a smaller source. No, no, I wasn't insinuating that they knew that it came from Sifted or from you. I was insinuating that they didn't do their their hard, the hard work to dig to see where those quotes came from at first. And it can be a lot of work. Not everyone watches Pactor Factor. So no, no, I, no, I would I, have to go I, back I, I and that. watch like five episodes of Pactor Factor to see if he said it there. It's Look, I'm not blaming these people for doing it because it's a lot of work to try to figure out if on some random podcast or in a random interview, if somebody said something first. And particularly when you have someone like Jeff Keighley with a huge following, you know, if he's going to say, you know, this is a quote that I got first, why wouldn't they believe him? He's Jeff Keeley. And then no, no, I, the no, Casper I is his audience. Yeah. And that's what sells it in the end is like, OK, well, let me think about this for a second. Well, you know, if he retweets this, you know, our article is going to blow up. So I don't know. I I, th- I don't think there's malice in a lot of that stuff. I'm not saying all of it, but I do think in a lot of cases, it's just the editor thinks that it's too much work for the payoff when they can just go with, okay, he absolutely did say it to Keeley. And if we attribute Keeley in the article, our article is going to get a lot more traffic than it would have otherwise. Now, two things. One, that's not uh, my issue. Cause I understand that that makes sense. That's not my issue. My issue is if let's say I put something out, right. Mm-hmm. And I, and you email me or you hit me up saying that, um, that it came from you first, Mm -hmm. then I'm going to change everything and make sure you get the uh, credit. What I'm trying to tell you is that there's people that I did that with. And they refuse to change the attribution to you. Exactly. Uh, That's one. That is wrong. That is absolutely wrong. That's the, so yeah. So that's the point I'm trying to make. And then, and to prove my point is secondly, when I was on N4G heavy before that situation uh, got out of hand, they told me personally, if I'm not mistaken, I think it was Chris uh, at N4G, if I'm not mistaken. Um, uh, but they told me personally that we don't consider now this, like, this is literally a story that like I broke, everybody knows it. Even like, just to give you an example, like Kratos being in Mortal Kombat that I'm just, I'm using that example as like, even though that was a while back, mm-hmm. but Kratos being in Mortal Kombat as an example, this is something that Ed Boon confirmed that I was the source like himself on camera. Like yep. you don't get no more realer than that. Yep. And they would, they would come to me and say, well, we don't consider your type of uh, coverage as credible. This is what was told to me directly. 
Okay. So the point I'm trying to say is my experience in this industry is very different (laughs) from a lot of other people's. And, and that's why I want to say that if, if, um, if you see something and you see it here first and you reported it, cause that's where you caught it first. I'm not fine. Like I I get that. Like, and and that all the stuff is deserving when it comes to that Jeff Keighley uh, example that you made. That's, that's fine. I have no issues with that. That makes sense. I get that. But if you found, if somebody brought it to your attention that a great job, but it was sourced wrong as a journalist in ethics, that's supposed to be changed and notified properly. That's wrong. It, yep, that's and, that is wrong. Editorial. That's the that's the that's the only point I'm trying to make. That's the only point I'm trying to make. And when things like that happens, that sits there permanently as mm-hmm. if it's not you. It's look, I did the same thing with Jeff directly. Like um uh I forgot what event we was at. Uh, but uh, um, this was around the time. This is a while back too. But this is around the time when PlayStation All Stars had came out, uh-huh. and um, and I was the one who broke the story that PlayStation All Stars was being made. And then um, Jeff had gave the credit to uh, a gentleman by the name of Paul Gale or something like that. And um, and I was like, nah, nah, that came from me. And I told Jeff personally, like to his face, like, nah, that came from me. And I showed him, and nothing happened. So mm-hmm. the point I'm trying to say is, like. Do you think if it were I, were me talking to Jeff and I had told him that, you think he would have changed the attribution? To be honest, I don't know, but yeah. I think there's a higher percentage that it would have been. Okay. You know what I mean? But honestly, definitely, I don't know. But what I'm trying to say is, even back then and even up to like right now as we speak and stuff like that, yep. th- this has been an ongoing thing. So like I said, I love being independent. I love just doing what I do, but my main goal is just to make things fair and to bring the love back to the gaming industry that, that made us love gaming in the first place when we was kids. Okay. Like that's always been my main thing. Do you think, a, again, kind of going back to it though, do you think a percentage of that might be the persona though? Um, not necessarily the color of your skin, but the fact that you do kind of have this alter ego that you carry along with you you think that that might be part of the reason why people don't view you as a credible source? Now, when you say alter ego, what do you mean by that? Because well, it's, like, there's you nothing know, altered. Like, like, you know what I'm saying? Like, well, it's like, like I said earlier, you, you don't take the belt out to lunch with you. You know, it is okay. a bit of a costume that you wear for certain things. Do you but think? It, but, but see, the thing is, it's like when you say, uh, I guess because the way you're wording it, because it's a part of our culture. Like, you know what I'm saying? I'm a big fan. Like, for example, my chain, like, I'm hip hop, bro. Like this, like yeah. wearing the chain orders of that. That's that's me. Like, and the thing is, like when I go to like certain interviews or if I'm going to events or whatever, like, yeah, you know, I'm rocking it. I got it. But if I'm going to the store, I'm not going to the event and I'm not dressing like I'm going to an event if I'm going to the store either. <laughs> like, you understand what I'm saying? So it's kind of like, um, it, for example, if, uh, if I'm you talking up- about the perception of others, though, not your perception of yourself. I'm, I'm talking about how people perceive you. And okay. why it might be that they wouldn't consider you a serious source for breaking news, quote. Yeah, on. because because it's not the com because it's not common. See, see, the thing is, it, when you, a lot of industries are a very majority rules mm-hmm. type of industry. Yep. So if you see everybody doing something, then that must be right. That's the way yep, a lot of I people agree with view that. it. Normative so, behavior. Yeah. Exactly. So if if look, look at a lot of people in the world of modeling, like. A, a so-called model has to be like real skinny and have to have a certain figure to be considered a model because this is the standard, right? right. Yeah. And then if somebody comes along that don't fit that so-called standard, then they're wrong. Like, you know what I mean? Or they're, they're, they don't fit in. Well, at the very I, least, they're going to be fighting an uphill battle to become a successful model, for sure. Exactly. Yeah. So in my situation, I don't fit into anything. In, in, in the way a lot of people operate in this industry. You fit in with fit, me, man. <laughs> yeah, well, no, I, I fit in with people that's real and that's real to themselves and that's and, and that's willing to be real at all times, not just when it's convenient. Yeah. You understand what I'm saying? Yep. Like, for example, like you you spoke about it yourself, how there's times on camera where you felt like you couldn't fully, fully be yourself because there was a certain stigma that may come along with that. And sometimes people just don't want to deal with that. And I get it. That's cool. I never dealt with that. I never second guess how I'm a be like, um, you know, like, like, you know, you know, in front of certain people or whatever, whatever, what you see is what you get. I'm the realist, like period. Yeah. And that comes with a lot of positives. 
And it also comes with a lot of negatives. But I don't care about the positive negatives. I care about what's right and wrong. And if you can be your full self and that's supposed to be right, then I should be able to be my full self in the same vicinity that you're in. And that could be right, too, because I'm not doing anything wrong. I'm not doing anything disrespectful. I'm not, you know, throwing things and making like, you know, what I mean, I'm not uh, I'm being professional or cordial and everything. You're just so being what's yourself. The difference? Yeah, exactly. But my you. question to you, Shane, is why is it being myself is a problem and being yourself is? not Yeah. Well, I, I just told you, though, I can't be myself. It is a problem. Ex- I'll tell you more. why I navigate it the way I do that. <laughs> like, for instance, I swear a lot in my private life. I just do. Yeah, I don't even curse. In I know my you private don't. life, too. I know I don't I'm just explaining, though, like how, I, how I change yeah. myself when I go on camera. I swear a lot in my when I'm hanging out with my friends or my wife or whatever. I swear. When I go on camera, I hardly ever swear. And and one one reason I do it is because I feel like when people swear a lot, it loses its impact over time. And so if you hear me swear on a podcast or a show or whatever, you know that I'm really fired up about something. Because that's the only <laughs> time I do it. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, the exactly. other reason I do it though is because I tend to look at the big picture and you, and I realize everything I put on camera is there forever. It never goes away. So I look at it like, okay, one day if I'm ever done with working on Sifted, if I want to get back and work with a company again and they start looking through this stuff and I'm just sitting there dropping the F bomb every other word, are they going to want to hire me? So, so, you know, it's... And you're right, it's me not being me on camera, but there's a reason why I do it. Um, so. Yeah, th- th- I, I get your point. So now one, one thing I wanted to, before I go on to something else, uh, one thing I wanted to uh, make mention of is there there's one bonus round episode where it was Jeff Keighley and Ingai Crow. Shout out to Ingai Crow, that's my bro right there. Yeah, and um, um, where, uh, I had broke uh, the news on on um, Nintendo uh, uh, Nintendo Switch, uh, I believe. I think it's Nintendo Switch or something like that. I, I got the video and everything of it, you know. But this is a while back, and um, and uh, Jeff uh, had um, changed like on on the show. He changed from what he had said before to giving me the credit on the show on oh, bonus great. round. So that, that is one time where he did change it. I just wanted to, like I said, okay. I'm a realist. I'm a fair person. Yeah, I, just, yeah. I just want things to be consistent. Like I mean, let's I, I be don't, honest, yeah. 99.9% of the time, Jeff is a great journalist. He does cross oh, yeah, his oh, yeah, yeah. and dot yeah, his eyes, and he will give proper credit to the people who deserve it. So I don't want yeah. people to leave this show thinking that Jeff is like some hack or something. Like he's not. No, 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 nah. Don't do that. No, because you're right. People take things out of context when you're just having a conversation. You know how the internet nah. is. They'll, they'll yeah, just pull nah. that one quote of you saying something and yeah. they want to hear the rest of the conversation. So yeah, nah, that's not the case. Like actually, the the last time I seen Jeff, um, uh, it was at um, I forgot. I think it was Pax West. The last time I seen Jeff, and we was in the um hotel lobby. We was talking. Um, we took a picture, and um, I had told him that I just did the uh partnership with Logitech because we was doing the gaming and guidance uh thing um to impact a lot of the uh, communities and the youth and things like things of that nature. And I, we had was talking about that. So yeah, don't get it twisted. Don't misquote nothing. You know what I'm saying? Like like that's. Like we already, me and Jeff already had like a conversation about things. Like, you know, yep. so that's, that's there. That's fine. That's good. Like, you know what I mean? There ain't nothing, no crazy there. What I'm saying is that um, uh, these are just instances that played a role in things that the uphill battle that I personally had to deal with. And I don't deal with it as much to uh, today, like I used to back then, but you does it still not, exist? You've been around yeah. now for like thirty years. Long time years. now, yeah, yeah, long time now, yeah. But um, but I will say this though, like never lose your joy, man. Yeah, don't let the industry beat you up. If there's something you don't like about the industry, voice about it, talk about it. I get it, but don't let it strip you of your joy. Never forget why we do what we do, and I think that's the most important thing. Okay, I want to talk to you about something that you do on the sidelines that nobody sees but i see and it has made me love you even more you do some amazing charity work in your community can you talk about that a little bit oh well that's a great segue because that's the gaming and guidance program (laughs) so uh so the gaming and guidance program man it's been one of the most impactful things i've ever done bro 
I'll like, say this. I was proud of you when I saw some of the stuff that you've been doing. It literally made me smile when I saw it. Wow. Dude, that means a lot coming from you, Shane. Wow. I, I mean that, man. Thank you, bro. Like, I, I'm going to share something with y'all real quick. Um, There was this, uh, my boy, um, Kenny, his son, Matthew, he lost his right hand. Oh, he geez. has, um, he's a gamer. He lost his right hand. And uh, he has muscular dystrophy type two, I oh, believe. Geez. Right. And, uh -huh. um, you know, shout out to my man Bryce over, you know, um, over at Microsoft because he he did the um, Xbox adaptive controller. Yep. And it shout out to amazing. Logitech. I, yeah, it, amazing. Shout out to Logitech, you know, because they did the parts and, you mm -hmm. know, they worked together as a joint venture. And Channel 12 News, um, my homegirl Lamara with uh, GPPR Public uh, Relations, um, we all came together to get him headsets for him and his father and get him to play games again. And let me tell you, Shane, because he's speaking through a um, – I forgot the name of this tube. But I forgot the name of the tube. I'm so sorry. It's okay. But, um, I think everyone knows what you're talking about, though. Yeah, but he was – he said that this is amazing for not just him, but for people like him to get him to play games again. And his father said this is the first time he smiled in, like, two years. Wow. And it – it's one thing to hear about these stories, but it's one thing to be there in front of his face, looking at him mm -hmm. and seeing that we was able to just help in that moment. And that you, right there changed a lot for me. Yeah. And you've been going into it. I couldn't quite tell whether it was a commu community centers or schools yes. or maybe both. Yes. Community centers, schools, bro. I go everywhere. So I don't care, man. I, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm there, man. And like, like one, like, there's so many stories I can share with you, but I'll tell you this one story. This girl was getting picked on and bullied because she couldn't speak any English and her mother couldn't speak any English as well. So the girl, not only did she learn English, but she's teaching her mom English, huh. teaching her friends English. And the kids that bullied her and stuff like that are best friends now because now she's teaching them some things about her language so they could be able to relate to each other even more. And Man. And with the program, a lot of these kids don't want to talk sometimes. You know uh -huh. what I'm saying? They like they in their shell and that's it. So the way we break barriers, we have them play games together. And that's when they play idea. games together, they have fun. They start loosening up. And then we have real conversations. But now they feel like they could trust us. They feel uh -huh. like they feel like they could they could trust us with their vulnerability. Yeah. And then that allows them to be more than what they are. And then now they could spread that to other kids and other friends that they have in their circles. Yeah. Bro, I, I've been doing this since 2017, man. And it's it's amazing. I, I mean, truly amazing. So that's another thing, like with the Gaming and Goddess program that I added to my arsenal, so to speak. So between being a musician, a journalist, content creator, business consultant, philanthropist, um, hip hop gamer, man, this this is me, bro. Do you have any message for young people of color who would like to follow in your footsteps? Oh, well, advice or anything like that. Yeah. Well, my message is always two things. One, character is your currency. And the second thing is eliminate fear. OK, I'm going I'm to tell you why. So especially growing up in the hood, um, too many times we value things instead of valuing who we are as a person mm -hmm. so we val we are validated by how much money you got how many cars you got how many girls you got how much jewelry you rocking like you know if you don't have these things then you're not successful that's the way it's labeled especially in the hood so especially in hip-hop we were talking it, about that earlier yeah, yeah. yeah that's what i'm saying in, in hip-hop in, in the hood all that stuff that narrative it's, it's just got it got to stop. It got to change because that narrative is getting people killed. Like for real. Like yo, dude, you got like there's kids out there that that are robbed their mother. Yeah, you know what I'm saying to get some Jordans just to be cool for people that don't even care about them. Yeah, I lived That's in how, I lived in North Philadelphia for seven years when I was going to college and I lived in Philadelphia and I yeah. saw stuff like that all the time in exactly our neighborhood. Yeah. It's crazy. So my thing is, but when you real realize that who you are is the value and to prove my point, when I say character is your currency, I haven't spoke to Shane in so long. 
Yeah. And he hit me up and I was like, I'm there. And it's like, we never stopped talking. Like, that's what I'm talking about. Who you are, Shane. Like, you need me for anything. If I got it, you got it. You don't even got to ask twice or anything. You just say it. If I got it, it's done. Well, and from from your perspective, we just launched this show and you're one of the first people I wanted to reach out to to talk to. So you left a uh, lasting impression on me for sure. And a good one. and, and that's important to me. So character is your currency. And that right there plays a part in relationships and things of that nature, because the relationships and stuff that you have will help you to get into better positions and, and help you to receive a lot of the blessings that you want in your life. So character is your currency. And the second thing is eliminate fear. And I use this in the for- form of a video game. So if you're looking at a boss battle, right, mm-hmm. that boss right there is like you defeat that boss and you know, you when you win, you get your trophy or you get something, but it's the ability to unlock your greatness. So a lot of times your boss, that boss battle that you're facing is yourself. A lot of times people have a fear of going to the next level because they worried about what other people are going to think or what yep. other people are going to say, or they just hold themselves back. Eliminate fear to unlock your greatness so you can receive the blessing that God wants to give you so you can get to the destination that you're trying to be a part of in your life. I love that message. Um, you've been now doing this for well over a decade. Yeah, what? man. Yeah, it's crazy. It's time flies by, man. And I've been full time since 2016. Yeah. So yeah. So, so what have you? Yeah. What has been the biggest change that you've seen in doing the job since you started? And what is one thing that you would like to see changed now? Ooh. Well, one of the things that I've seen change is that there's a lot more companies that don't care about gaming but got a lot of money trying to <laughs> trying to get into trying to get into the game industry thinking that they could buy their way into it. it That's one of the first us. things. That's one of the first things I'm saying that uh-huh. people who are well I wouldn't say that it works really like that in the I reason why sometimes. I say sometimes. Yeah. Well yeah yeah sometimes but like uh I feel like um one thing I love about gaming is that you still got to respect the dollar. You still got to buy the console, you got to yeah. buy the games, you got to buy this and because of that, because of the nature of the gaming industry, um, you still got to respect the dollar, which means everybody can't just buy their way in. You'll want them lose a lot of money if you're not authentic. Yeah. And, and I love that because in music and movies, man, you get away with that stuff a lot easier. A lot more. Yeah, for sure. A lot more. But in gaming, yeah. nah. So yeah. that's 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 one thing. Now, what's um, the one and, thing you would change? Yeah. Oh, well, the one thing that I would like to change is... I would love for people to to look at people from an authentic standpoint instead of just a number. Okay. Uh, I'll give you an example of what I mean. Like, I've seen a lot of times companies that go after somebody because of their following, and they'll spend all this money with somebody with a following, but but then they won't even see results. Mm-hmm. Or or they invest in somebody that they know nothing about, but they know they got a lot of followers. And so you're talking about influencers know, now is basically what you're talking uh, about. Yeah, like not not just influencers, YouTubers, streamers, uh, anyone that just got high value numbers and companies blindly uh, throw money at people because of their numbers, not because if they're actually good for what you're trying to do. It's lazy, like lazy, like you saw about earlier where like a lot of sometimes journalists could do a lazy job. You know what I'm mm-hmm. saying? I just think it's real lazy. See, the thing is gaming culture, like gaming uh is the you know culture but esports and all this other stuff it's a part of that culture it's not yeah. everything it's a part of it and what i'm seeing right now is a lot of companies that know nothing about the gaming industry they will do like a google search of like well who's the who's the hottest person right now who i have cool. the most followers on twitter or yeah. who has let me the get most this. subscribers on youtube yeah. yeah so let me get this person because if i get this person that means that i'm cool now so let me just get that well, really, isn't it really more about reach, though? They're just trying to reach as many people as possible. And I would argue that it doesn't work in that case either. I think you see, have you checked out the new gaming TV network called Ven at all? Yeah, of course. They got a lot of money. They drop a lot of money, but they still got a lot of work to do. Well, you look at the people who are on the shows. Are they good hosts? Do they really know video games? Or are they well, pe- it, well, or are they people well, it, who have huge followings on social media or on Twitch or on YouTube, et cetera? Well, I can't speak for everyone, but in terms of Aaron, Aaron Ashley Simon, she knows her stuff. So I respect that. And Cash Nasty, for what they got him up there for, he knows her stuff because he works out and he plays a bunch of 2K. So that right there, those things made sense. 
in terms of um everybody else, I haven't dive that deep to be able to accurately 100% uh you know on um, decipher uh that question, but what I can say, what I can say is that then overall as a network, they 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 have a lot more work cut out for them. If, if they, <laughs> You're if trying, they're trying to say Trying to be very nice. <laughs> yeah. No, now nah, I'm just keeping it real. They got a lot more. Yeah. Work. They got a lot more work to do because, like, I'll give you an example. One of the articles that they did recently, um, they was talking about how uh they they got to do more short form short form content because that's what people gra- uh, is uh, adopting to now. So this and that. See, the problem with a lot of these companies is you're trying to adjust to an audience. That ain't going to work. You got to make a, a audience adjust to you if this is what you want to do. You got to make them love what you do. Well, they're chasing like, instead of leading is what they're thanks, doing. Thank you. That's yeah. what I was looking for. Like the problem with Vin that I see is that they're chasing. They're trying to make everybody happy. That's impossible. That's not going to work. You got to do what you do and make people come to you. Period. You know what I'm saying? Like, yep. like I'm going to keep it. I'm going to keep it like all the way a thousand percent with you, bro. And stuff like that. A lot of the stuff that people are doing and seeing that I'm watching, a lot of that stuff, whether certain people admit it or not, a lot of stuff came from me. Because a lot of stuff that I, I was doing out the gate in terms of being defiant against the big corporations and the companies and, and speaking my mind, saying this, saying this and doing that and stuff like that. It wasn't cool to do the things that I was doing. That's why so many people try to stay away from it and stay away from me because they didn't want to be associated with what wasn't cool at the moment to do. Now that it's cool to do the very thing that I've been doing out the gate and being independent and all this other stuff and speaking up for myself and blah, blah, blah. Now that it's cool to do that. Now everybody's like, yeah, I'm this, I'm that. That wasn't always the case. It's, it's a, it's a very few people that stood out on their own independent and built their worth that way. And then you got a lot of other people that was able to transition into being independent from benefiting from having a job with a big, you know, um, uh, website or, you know, a big position like that. It's like if Stephen A. Smith from ESPN left ESPN, he's going to be all right. Because all the years that he he benefited being on ESPN, he can literally start his own network and people will still follow him because yeah. he's already solidified. Yeah. So my thing is for the people that's not solidified doing the, doing the things that they're doing now is getting a lot of attention more that, uh, that aggression, that unapologetically being themselves. That wasn't cool to do before. I think it could you also understand? be argued that you may be one of the first influencers. Um, Cause if you look at a lot of the Twitch streamers, they have like a lot of them have like the more popular ones have like a thing. So you look at like Dr. Disrespect, like it's a yeah. char- it's a character that people have resonated with um, in a lot of ways. I feel like you were one of the progenitors of, of that whole thing, which is uh, pretty amazing. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I can see that. But the difference is, is my name is hip hop. You're a good person. Every, <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. But, like, but everything is uh, when, when it comes to hip hop game, but everything ties to me. Yeah. Like, for example, right. Let's just keep it real. Um, If you look at people's name and brands like Ninja is not a ninja in real life. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Right. Dr. Disrespect is he just I don't like, think are you talking about Dr. Disrespect or not to disrespect Ninja? <laughs> <laughs> You're so stupid. Now, I'm just talking about if you look at people's names and their brands, if you look at the average person that has a like brand, like name and stuff like that. Um, you're trying to figure out how it connects to them personally. Right. Because that's and usually it doesn't. Like it usually ninja. it doesn't. That's what I'm saying. Usually it <laughs> yeah. doesn't. When you talk about hip hop gamer, my name is based off my lifestyle. Yeah. It's based off. It's and real. the thing is, yeah. I'm not just a fan of hip hop. I'm an artist. Like I make songs. I got songs yeah. in games. Like I do this. So that's that. Gamer. I'm a gamer. My grandma's told me I've been this all my life. This is what I do. I know it in and out. So my name is me so there's no alter ego there's no character if you want to say putting on a belt that's showmanship if you want to call it that that's showmanship that's fine yeah. but at the end of the day it still relates to my personality because out yeah. the gate i always said i was the best yeah so if you're a champion you're the best i always said i was the best i still say i'm the best now 
And if anybody don't agree with that, that's fine because everybody has their own opinion. But I got data to back up a reason <laughs> why I say that. All right. And I can hold that up against anybody. Fair so enough. So that's what, that's what makes me the, the realist in my opinion. All right. Well, before we let you go, we ask everyone who comes on three night weekend, what are they playing? What are they watching? And what are they drinking this weekend? Oh, wow. So what am I playing? Um, well, I'm about to play Ariel night. You know what I'm saying? Uh, Ariel night needs a lot of love. You know what I'm saying? Uh -huh. uh, black, uh, black game developer. And I think he published it too, right? I believe if so. I yeah. I think it is self-published. Yeah. All right, cool. So, um, so my thing is, he needs a lot of love right now. You know what I'm saying? So, mm -hmm. um, wait, uh, is that it? oh, sorry, uh, Neil Jones. Like, Neil Jones, he need a lot of love right now. His game just came out today, Ariel Knight. It's $12. Support him. Go buy that. That I'm going to be playing that. Um, on top of Ariel Knight, me playing that. I'm playing Resident Evil 8 Village. Game is incredible. And um, I'm playing Mass Effect Legendary Edition, playing that as well. I'm just blown away by that, um, just how amazing it looks. Yeah, so I'm excited about that. On it. Yeah. They did a great job on it, man. So I'm playing those uh, right now. The next thing I will tell you is, uh, um, you said, uh, what am I drinking? What are you watching first? Oh, what yeah. oh, what am I watching? Yeah. All right, so I'm going to tell you two things, two things. Godfather Harlem, you know what I'm saying? I'm watching that uh, on Epic's. But also, like literally every night before bed, I watch Scrubs. That's one of my oh. favorite shows, man. I love <laughs> Scrubs, yo. This and you know what, yo, yo, Shane. I had John C. McKinley on my show twice. That's awesome. John C. McKinley, <laughs> that, that's my guy. Matter of fact, I got a video I'm gonna put out. John C. McKinley was rapping, son. I got him on <laughs> film rapping, yo. He was like, oh, gee, dog. My name is, dude. like, yo, it that's was great. crazy too. It was good. It was good. So, so shout out to John C. McKinley. And then, um, and, and what then are you what am drinking? I, what am I drinking? Yeah. Water. I never drank. Yo, you, yo, listen, Shane, I never drunk in my life. Like, I've never, never drunk. been drunk in your entire life. No, I never drank in my life. I never, never had drank. a sip of alcohol your entire I, life. No, no, never. I never smoked. I never drank in my life, bro. Wow. Well, I'll, I'll, you know, you'll be surprised though. I would say so far on this show, 80% of the people we've interviewed do not drink. Really? Yep. Well, wow, because in the game industry, I'm gonna tell you right now. Most people are lushes and they're hammered at the events. I know, but yo, because uh, I don't listen, man. That's another thing too. A lot of people talk about parties in the game industry. People like I don't care what you say, gamers. We know how to party. Son. I agree with that. The parties. You'd be surprised, crazy, actually. Son. Yeah, I think yes. a lot of people just think we're all a bunch of nerds, but yeah, nah, we party. Yeah, the Let's parties fire. are crazy. But look, I haven't had a, dr a drop of alcohol since February of last year, since the pandemic started. I don't really. No, yeah, wow. I only I drink socially. Like I don't drink to get drunk. I drink to just have great conversations with people. And since we've all been locked down for the last twelve months, I've had no reason to drink. So yeah, I think a lot but of people are that way. Yo, this has been amazing. Yo, Shane, man, um, at some point in time, uh, I would love to get you on for like a special E3 episode on Hot 97, bro. I would love uh, to I, come on. I would on. love to get you on and talk about E3. And then also, man, um, with uh with Sifted off camera, well, you know, well, you know, off, you know, once we cut the show off, off the record, like yeah. off the record, um, I gotta talk to you about some stuff that I'm working on that uh I think could be valuable to you too. Okay, that's great. You know what I'm saying so, yeah. yeah. Let's do it. Word. Uh, but man, thank you so much for coming on the show. I just want to let you know I have a ton of respect for what you do. I know it hasn't been easy for you to have the success that you've had, and I also know that you've had to fight a lot harder for it than most people have had to. So, just a ton of respect for you. You're my friend. You know, I know a lot of people in the industry. I consider you one of my friends in the industry, and uh, I just really appreciate you taking the time to uh, be on the show. Yo, bro, that means a lot, man. And I'm I'm telling you, man, I'm a I'm be so so real with the audience, man. Um Shane Satterfield, uh Scott Fry, you know, Patrick Perkins, um, Michael Pactor, you know, there's there's a ton of other people to name, you know what I'm saying? My boy uh Torrance Davis, who brought me into the uh you know industry and everything. Mm -hmm. Uh my boy Javen, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, uh like my girl ran in for me. You know, um, they, uh, there's so many, uh, Tony, uh, Polanco, Godfrey, Paris, like there's so many people to name, but 
I wanted to, I said that to say this, Shane was one of those dudes in the beginning when it really wasn't cool to rock with Hip Hop Gamer. And I know this for a fact because there was people that told me personally that they couldn't even be around me or talk to me or even certain PR that was like hesitant to give me interviews, even though they wanted to, because they was afraid that they, they'll get in trouble just by association with me because they didn't want my image to get too big in the game industry to the point where my image would be the standard. Mm-hmm. They didn't want that to become that. That's one of the reasons why I was removed of the N4G because my articles was on the front page and it was the highest with the fire, like, you know, with the ratings. Mm-hmm. And that became a problem. <laughs> That's and absurd. It, yo, I, this is real documented stuff, man. Like, well, I'll, just so, say, I'll just say this for anyone listening to this. If you hear that about N4G and it makes you unhappy, you're more than welcome at the world's best content aggregator sifted where shit like that does not happen. Thank you. <laughs> and one, one thing I wanted to say, Shane, is through all of that, man, you was one of those few that always talked to me, always showed me love, always had real conversations, not just gaming conversations, just real yeah. conversations, like real friendship stuff. Real like brotherhood type of stuff, bro. Like you yeah. all always. So I just personally on your show, <clears throat> I want to thank you immensely, man, because well, that means a lot. And it was a major driving factor for me through the personal battles I had to get through in the industry. So thank you, bro. Well, thank you for being an amazing person, because that's really all I see you as. So <laughs> you're just another great person in my life that I'm very thankful for. So Gerard, thanks again for coming on. Where can people find you on social media, on YouTube, Twitch, etc.? Yo, man, the easiest thing you could do, bro, is Google me, Hip Hop okay. Gamer. Everything comes up in every area. <laughs> <It'll be laughs> lit, sir. It's Hip Hop Gamer across the board everywhere. All right. Thanks again for coming on the show. Thank you, bro. Let's get it popping, baby, all day. Now that we know what Gerard is doing with his weekend, let's maximize your free time over the next couple days. Games. It's a slow weekend for game releases, but we got a couple here. First up, Rust Console Edition launches for PS4 and Xbox One. This sandbox survival shooter has been a huge hit on PC for years and years now, so all we have to say is it's about time. And then the final game worth considering over the weekend is Metopia, which is launching for Switch. If you remember, it was a 3DS RPG driven entirely by characters that you create. It did not do great with critics when it came out, but hopefully some tweaks and additions for the Switch version will help it do a little bit better. TV and film! It's another great weekend for new TV and film releases. First up, and the biggest of the weekend, undoubtedly, is Army of the Dead. It is premiering on Netflix and in theaters this weekend. It is a heist movie set during a zombie apocalypse in Las Vegas. The trailers for the movie have been insane. Definitely set aside some time this weekend to check it out. Next up, Four Good Days with Mila Kunis and Glenn Close debuts this weekend. It is on VOD only, and it follows Kunis as she is in a rehab facility over a four-day period. And finally for this weekend, Marvel's MODOK Season 1 debuts on Hulu. It follows the villain as he goes through a midlife crisis, so should be more of a comedic take on the Marvel IP. Music! Remember Gary Newman? Probably not, but I bet you remember his most famous hit, Cars. His new album, Intruder, is available starting today. The synth-pop god behind the 80s hit returns with his first album in four years, but it does sound different. It's almost like a cross between industrial from the 80s and 90s and EDM. Next, we know a lot of you aren't into country western music, but some of you may be, so we're going to cover this one because it is a big release. Blake Shelton's new album, Body Language, his first album in five years, releases today. He's probably been busy with all the American Idol and other TV stuff that he does these days, but I'll say this, the production on that album is pretty darn good. And then finally, the third album that we recommend that came out today is 21 Pilots, Scaled and Icy. If you don't know this band, I'm not a huge fan of them, but I have to admit, they write a lot of catchy hooks. 
I, I listen to their songs and I'm like, I shouldn't like this, but somehow I do end up liking a lot of their songs. Uh, if you aren't familiar with them, they are kind of like an indie pop electronic group. They almost defy description, but anyway, give them a listen. You might like their new album. Again, 21 Pilots, Scaled and Icy. Sports! It's a big sports weekend. Obviously, the NHL playoffs have already been going full bore. And man, if you're not watching them, you should. There have been like six overtime games already in the first like few days. Again, the NHL playoffs are going on all weekend long. But also, the NBA playoffs are here. Let's kick it off with Friday. If you like baseball, the Brewers are playing the Reds on Fox Sports 1 at 7 p.m. And then the final game of the NBA season before the playoffs kick off, it's the Memphis Grizzlies versus the Golden State Warriors. The winner goes into the playoffs, and the loser is eliminated, and that's on at 9 p.m. on ESPN. Next up, the PGA Championship is on ESPN at 1 p.m. Eastern, and then it moves to CBS for Saturday and Sunday. And then finally, as I said, the NHL playoffs are going on all weekend long. They're on a number of networks. If you just keep flipping around, you'll find them. Uh, NBC, NBC Sports Network, USA, and CNBC will all be carrying live games. Moving to Saturday, if you're like me and you're going through football withdrawal, we are really in the dregs of it here where we have really nothing going on until training camp kicks off. There's a new league called the Spring League Football Uh, That's supposed to fill that void, and it is airing on Fox at 3 p.m. Next up, the first round of the NBA playoffs tip off on ESPN, ABC, and TNT. The first game is at 1 p.m. on Saturday. And then in the Premier League, there's a game at 10.55 a.m. on NBCSN, but the teams are to be announced. Moving to Sunday, if you're an F1 fan, the Monaco Grand Prix is on ABC at noon. And then Premier League Soccer is on NBC proper at 11 a.m. But the teams, again, are to be determined. And then finally, if you like your racing a little more oval-based, the NASCAR Echo Park Texas Grand Prix is on Fox Sports 1 at 2.30 p.m. Esports. It's a really slow weekend for esports. There's only one tournament with a 100K purse or higher. And that is the Counter-Strike Elisa Invitational 2021. And the only other tournament really worth mentioning from this weekend is the Rainbow Six Siege 6 Invitational 2021. The purse is to be announced. However, this is Ubisoft's big official tournament for the year. Thanks for checking out Three Night Weekend on Sifted Games at sifted.net. A huge thanks to Gerard Williams, a.k.a. Hip Hop Gamer, for candidly sharing his experience working in the games industry. If you want to get Three Night Weekend when it's hot and fresh, head to patreon.com slash sifted and drop us a pledge. If you pledge at $4 a month or more, you'll get all our content early, like our flagship show Game Face and Pactor Factor, starring Michael Pactor. If you want to know when the show is posted for free on our YouTube channel, make sure to follow the site on Twitter at Sifted Games. You can also reach out to me at Dinfire if you want to suggest future guests. I'm Shane Satterfield reminding you that every weekend is a three-night weekend. Three-night weekend.